Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the March Madness 2024 Bracket for the Media Boat Podcast. This is it. We've reached the end. This is the finale. We are going to have the semifinals and finals of this best picture face-off for our March Madness 2024. We have gone through the first couple of rounds. We have our competitors in our semifinals, and we're ready to break it down to our final two and choose what is the best best picture winner of the last 16 years. My name is Matt, and joining me, but you can't see him, is Mike. He's here. Hi, I'm Mike. You might recognize yeah. me from the Media Vote podcast. <laughs> yes, you and recognize And others. <laughs> <laughs> and other side <laughs> projects of the podcast. Yeah, so far it's just been me solo on these, but I'm happy to have Mike here to help me not just ramble to myself for 17 minutes. Um, That's so okay. That... We'll ramble together for yeah, 18 exactly. minutes. It's the best uh, combined ramble and uh, is the best approach for it. So without further ado, let's hop into our semifinals. I have the tournament on the screen right now so you all can see what we're dealing with. We yeah. have two matchups to do before we reach the finals matchup. And uh, let's just talk about the first one, why don't we? Which is... Well, before we get there... Okay, yes. I have a bone to pick with you. You have on, a bone to pick. Um, now, does how do you've this? created these, so... Hey, first of all, I want to establish, you were the one who seeded this tournament. Yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't think you were taking it so literal, though. Yeah, I did. Yes. Because... <laughs> uh, I would not have put Parasite with everything ever all at once in the first matchup. I would That's say the four round had two were round three. That's but the matchup you here had. Here we are. That's, That's okay. what you had it. Um, also of note, when you talked about the Hurt Locker, uh -huh. you said it was the only woman director in the bracket. I know, I know. You correct That me. was wrong. You forgot about Chloe Zhao in Nomadland, who also won for Best Director for Nomadland. And somehow you'd put that as a ding, or you didn't mention it, that it won both director and uh, best picture for Nomadland. Yes. Yes. In your bad. fight against Moonlight, which <laughs> you, then you put Moonlight forward. I was like, but it won both here. Moonlight didn't do that. What are you doing here? <laughs> well, okay. I'm one person. I didn't have Wikipedia open the whole time. Your mind is a Wikipedia. Anyways anyways uh but all that being said the four movies that we do have in our finale here mm -hmm. in our final four i think are pretty accurate in terms of both impact visual impact and in terms of um the the meaning behind winning a an oscar uh, winning the best picture with yeah. parasite moonlight 12 years of slave and No Country for Old Men, which was our cutoff point. Yeah, it turns out. Uh, I think it's a bit, a pretty broad um, survey of the decade, too, if you look at the 2010s, mm -hmm. uh, I think that, and a little before. And so, yeah, I think that, I think we landed up in an okay space, uh, but you will, I think, offer some insight that maybe I wouldn't be able to by myself. So I'm glad I have the assist this week um, as we go into these matchups specifically. Yes, because you had quite the tough time picking between Spotlight and No Country for Old Men. Yeah. Although, I still think you chose correctly there with No yeah, Country well, for Old Men. But we'll get there, because we have Christy to go with our first Christy says I was wrong. Uh, she was a team Spotlight, and she was very disappointed to see the direction I went there. So oh, Okay, well, I will explain to her why she's wrong there. But first, <laughs> let's get to Parasite and Moonlight. Two completely yes. different takes on a Best Picture film. Indeed. So yeah, Parasite, the winner from 2019, like I had mentioned in the previous show, surprised a lot of people. I think by winning Best Picture, it came out of nowhere for a lot of the Academy Award audience. And then the flip side, Moonlight, which I think the surprise was that it almost didn't win uh, when the wrong envelope was read and La La Land was the prospective winner. Uh, that was quickly corrected and Moonlight rightfully won. Uh, but Regardless, two very different scenarios. I think one went in as the underdog and one went in as the favorite, and both ended up being Best Picture winners. But against each other uh, presents us an interesting matchup here. And I'm going to go through with my take of when I watched both of these films. Uh -huh. 
And that is that when I watched Moonlight back in 2015, when it was released, um, I liked it, but I also wasn't in love with it. I was on Team La La Land when it was nominated, <laughs> when it was sweeping all the awards during the ceremony, being, mm-hmm. oh, it's just going to set up for La La Land. And sure enough, La La Land was announced as the Best Picture winner. Only for it to then immediately get changed in the envelope fiasco that we all now know, love, adore, and punish, <laughs> I guess I would say. <laughs> um, so I think Moonlight's legacy is less about the film Moonlight and more about that fiasco, though. Yeah. However, when you talk about legacy with Parasite, I'm not sure if there is one to talk Mm -hmm. about that being said i absolutely loved parasite when i saw it and i absolutely deserved to win (laughs) because it was a story that came out about class about parasites not just within a community but within a family uh kind of a crab mentality but also just the cinematography and direction that it came out of nowhere from bong joon ho to direct this um Mm -hmm. and you're right it did come out of nowhere because it wasn't on anyone's radar but people who saw it absolutely loved it there's a lot of imagery within parasite that i fell in love with watching the Mm -hmm. first time it actually was one of the films that i watched again when hbo max came out i was like i want to make sure i watch this film again because it was i felt it was that good and that powerful Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where I land between these two of them is that between these two, I would rather watch Parasite again because there's a lot of different nuanced takes from a director, from a writer's point, from a cinematography point that I think I do not get with Moonlight. But sure. I know you really like Moonlight, though. Especially the look of it. That's the thing. Is It's a very striking movie. It's called Moonlight, and it does deliver on that vibe. There's so many scenes at night I think it, I kind of re- recall a lot of scenes of like the beach at night, which are very, mm-hmm. very, very well shot. That poster itself kind of gives you, and I said this in a previous show, but that poster itself gives you kind of a preview of this like moody blues and purples kind of vibe. And I think it takes advantage of the fact that what that, that the cinematographer knows how to shoot uh uh, the, to shoot black people specifically and it, it shows them in such a unique light because it's their story I think the cinematography is playing into the themes of the movie and saying like no this is this is a unique perspective on this experience this coming of age tale and really it creates a powerful like it, it makes the the imagery even more powerful because of that because of the way it's lit because of the way the cinematography looks so it's just interesting that you're focusing so much on cinematography, cinematography with Parasite as well, because I think that's a big strength of both of these films. No, you're. I know you're right in that. I mean, Moonlight in its cinematography in terms of color, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. but Parasite in terms of cinematography for its shot composition. So you have mm-hmm. two different types of school of thought when it comes to cinematography in a film sure. of striking visuals in in color, like you said, in making sure that each, uh, not de- decade, it's like 12 years in between each um, yeah, yeah. time frame. Okay. Each frame is shot in a specific lighting. Each yeah. has its own specific glow about it, and each has its own specific kind of growth between the two main characters and how they feel and interact mm-hmm. with each other. Yeah. Whereas Parasite in cinematography is, while it does have color implemented, it is more in terms shot in terms of cinematography, in terms of lines, in terms of division, mm-hmm. showing class division, showing like underground division, showing division within the lighting, showing division within people coming into frame and out of frame, and showing hidden divisions as well. So yeah. it's an interesting case to have these two like schools of thoughts in cinematography. Yeah. So I think from a technical perspective, I think they're pretty neck and neck is basically what we're saying here is that like if taken on the technical parts is that they're both doing very good with the kind of thing that they're trying to do. 
So then the other the other part of the conversation I think we should go back to, circle back to, which you already kind of brought up, is the subject of legacy. And here's where I think this is kind of where I'm kind of leaning, is what I'll tell you. I think that, yeah, the narrative of Parasites Win, the fact that it is um that it is an underdog story, the fact that it was something that was not necessarily the favorite going into the night. That was a surprise for a lot of people. And um, the fact that it comes out in 2019, uh, which is an interesting year now uh, in retrospect, right? Because it's on the, pre it's in the, in the kind of the dog days of the Donald Trump pre presidency here in the U S then also takes place right before the global pandemic in 2020. And so you have a it stands on this as this unique little like time period, like it's very of its time, but not in a bad way, where it's like it's about a class struggle. And I think it resonated with people because of how deep the class divide had become in that era and was only going to be exacerbated by the pandemic. And so I think if you look at it as a piece of art in its time, it is extremely poignant and extremely matters at that point. Um, I think you can make probably a better argument for that than the more general themes of Moonlight. Not to say, and I'm not trying to say that it's not less that it's less important in any way, because Moonlight, like I've said before, does an incredible job of putting you in the like in the life of a like what it is to be a modern black person in the kind of circumstances of that kind of coming of age story. And I think that it does a stellar job of doing that or reflecting that. But a coming of age film in, in just the most general sense is more general and can kind of doesn't necessarily need to be in a time and place. And so I think if you're talking about something that's going to be referred to for years in the future as something like, oh, yeah, that one best picture for these reasons. And this is explicitly explicitly why and this is why it still matters as a great film today. I think you have a stronger argument potentially for Parasite as a time place message than you do in Moonlight, which is just a more general, but still very well crafted story. Um, I think that's kind of where I'm leaning. I don't know what your temperature there is. I'm kind of leaning the same way, but for an added layer in that Parasite in its win, because it was an international film to win Best Picture, mm -hmm. feels like it's a correction on the Academy site for yes. awarding Green Book the victory yeah. over Roma the year prior, which still bitter about it. Roma should have won it. Yeah. But it was also too. one international film and two a Netflix film, which the Academy was yeah. not was not in favor of at the time. And that does actually bring back an interesting point because I think all of these films, well, maybe except for one, which we'll get to in the next matchup, <laughs> have the, are part of this conversation about the hashtag Oscars to white controversy uh that yes. happened in the 2010s. Where you have this conversation that happened about like, well, are people, uh, are minorities being nominated as many times as the white, as white people are? Are stories about minority characters being promoted as heavily? Are they being lobbied as heavily? And there was a moment, as you can see by some of these winners, where these minority stories were being celebrated. And I think there is a worry that we're moving away from that again. That after Parasite, you suddenly that suddenly that dries up. I mean, what after Parasite? You have Nomad Land, you have Coda, and depending on how you read Coda, that could also be a minority story, as you know, mm -hmm. the deaf community is highlighted in that film. But generally speaking, you go from this to and there's everything everywhere at once was an exception to that. Which is an exception to that. But generally speaking, you have all of a sudden a return, an immediate turnaround on that Oscar so white conversation when it comes to best picture. And it is sad to see. So I think you're right pointing out that Parasite is a highlight of that conversation and was the peak, if you will, of that correction um, that quickly, quickly got uh, not necessarily forgotten, but at least buried in the pandemic years. I think that may also be one point in Parasite's favor is that mm -hmm. following its win, it opened up a lot more people to the South Korean cinema. Yeah. And it opened up Netflix to a lot of those takes. I mean, and as we've seen, yeah, like even recently with 
um, uh, what was it? Not, not physical one hundred. The other one, the yeah. uh, mm-hmm. one where they're killing everyone. That's uh, um, uh, uh, Squid Game. Squid Game, yes. Yeah, Squid Game. Well, uh, I mean, it shows a important. general societal uh, like trend in yeah. the U.S. to embrace Korean culture. I mean, we see that with BTS and K-pop mm-hmm. being as huge as they are now. And I think that yeah, Parasite is part of that conversation, even though Parasite and BTS driving... could not be any more different than each other. Yes, has. I recognize that it's not a driving factor for it, sure. but it is within the conversation that it happened around the same time as the, all those influences. Yeah. Interesting nonetheless. Um, yes. So I think we're leaning towards Parasite here, which makes me a little sad because I think I do really love Moonlight and love what it's trying to do and really appreciate all the work and soul that goes into it. Yes. But I think for the purposes of this bracket, I think we are making a pretty convincing case for Parasite. And I think Parasite will move forward then. I think it will. Let me give it the point and submit. And voila, Parasite. Against all odds, just like when it went, one best picture has ended up in our finals. <laughs> all right, now let's do the, the um, I don't know if this is going to be a more difficult one or a more complicated one. Our second matchup here. Yep. Uh, 12 Years a Slave versus No Country for Old Men. Yes. One of these films was very heavily marketed, very heavily created, very heavily introduced and pushed to be a best picture winner yeah compared to the other one which was <laughs> not as as much but gained momentum based on a a two horse race at the time yeah yeah i think um, yeah i think it's a complicated story with no country for old men because yeah you do you do mention it was a race to the finish between it and there will be blood yep yeah, and um, both very tough movies to like to separate from each other. They are kind of thought of in the same mind because of that, because of how closely their races were tracked. Um, yeah, and then there's Twelve Years a Slave, which came into it as the heavy favorite. Yeah, against, I mean against uh, nothing really i mean Wolf of wall street <laughs> was probably the closest one to it right in terms of anything but even then like when it came down to the day of everything was riding on 12 years of slave and it ended up mm-hmm. winning it's kind of the seminal as you mentioned oscar so white from the <laughs> two years prior to it yeah so it did feel like an overcorrection i wouldn't say overcorrection but well, it, did, it did feel like something that yeah you're right I don't think it was a surprise either because I, like you said, I think a lot of weight went into um, the lobbying for the film. Cause if you know anything about best picture, you know that for years, the name on the street was lobbying, especially if you're talking about Miramax and big studios mm-hmm. like that, it was pretty much whoever made the best case behind the scenes for the film and put the most money behind its campaign that ended up always winning. It was less about the actual merit of the film. Not saying that necessarily that 12 Years a Slave did not deserve it. As you said, there wasn't a whole lot of competition when you're talking about it. And from what I understand, I have not seen it, but from what I understand, it is an extremely powerful depiction of what it was like to be a slave in those times. And so the fact that you have such a heavy message and such a heavy thematic uh, thematic weight to it, paired with, from what I understand, just like, so amazing filmmaking going into depicting it like uh it definitely has more of a best picture ring to it but then you think about legacy and i think this is mo- this is the point in no country for old men's favor you mentioned that it has a memorable year in the best picture race because of its competition mm-hmm. then you also on top of that have the directing duo of the cohen bro- cohen brothers who besides this have not returned to the best picture pedestal they've tried and several of their other movies have been nominated have failed to win they have failed to reach the heights of their win for no country for old men even though they will go down as some making as creating some of the most like interesting and i think important movies of the last two decades 
it is interesting um looking at like the you said the directorial trajectory of these two different films yeah not just from creating it to it from where it came from prior for these directors like the Coen brothers and steve mcqueen but where they went on after it as yes. well yes and uh, i'm gonna get on my pedestal here i'm gonna vouch for okay. no country for old men here all right that it being a 16 year old film has memorable shots throughout it is still talked about as you mentioned yeah. not just for its uh, immense oscar race but for its portrayal of its characters as well with anton chigurh just an immediate iconic yeah. villain i want to mention real quick something that christy wanted you to know she says she remembers really liking this movie however she said it scared her to the point where she walked home from the theater and was scared that 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 the villain of the film was chasing her. <laughs> because see, to show you the powerful the pat the how powerful that performance was. Yeah, but that's also what powerful of it is that he didn't have any like noble markings. It was just a I mean, the most thing notable about him was the bowl cut. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, the bowl cut scariest. Uh, yeah, obviously, but just, it, what ended up looking like a normal man, <laughs> and just have a uh, being a bounty hunter and mm. flipping that damn coin. <laughs> so, um, letting the wills of the fate. Come I think into this it. brings us to the toughest part of this conversation. I think is obviously one. I think thematically is has to carry a heavier weight than the other. I think when yes. you have something as historically significant as slavery in the United States against a piece of fiction, <laughs> it's kind of hard to necessarily weigh those and compare them thematically, right? Like you're going in expecting one thing from one of these movies and something else from the others. It's a little bit of apples to oranges. I realize that. But when you're coming out of each uh, each of these movies, it's, I think, a fair question to ask for the purposes of this bracket which one hits the heaviest and i'm not sure if i know i'm not sure i think no country for old men definitely hits the longest because <laughs> I, you'll be hard pressed to find any tv show that goes 100 episodes or longer and <laughs> does not have a title of the episode referenced yeah. no country for old men yeah or no blank for old men no country for blank yeah. men you'll I be hard pressed when... to find any tv show without that in its title it's true. And, an and video games, too. I was going to say, when they were doing the run-up to uh, Last of Us Part 2, I remember how many headlines, how many preview headlines said something, a joke about No Country for Old Men, because yeah. they would show all those clips of old Joel. Yeah, or like even, it's... like, even in video games in trophy hunting, yeah, you'll have a trophy, like, No Country for Old Men, or No Blank for Old Men, or some yeah. variation of that referencing this film so in terms you know, of a legacy it is yeah. everywhere it is something that just continues i do also have to bring this up because of what we're talking about right now is relevant is the the vibe of the movie industry though is so different now than it was in 2007 i think that's important to mention I feel like 2007, you still had a lot more eyes on something like the Oscars than you do now. You had a lot more. It was a pop culture moment that I think cultivated this. Like, for example, I think you have SNL sketches that make fun of No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood. I don't think you do. You had that for 12 Years a Slave in 2013 <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons, but also for not so obvious reasons. Right. <laughs> the vibe had shifted. I think that there was a pop culture consensus where we're all more of a monoculture back then, where we're all kind of absorbing these big event movies at the same time. And I think you have less and less of that as we go further in the future in this list. And so part of what you're saying, I think, is what that is responsible for. I think that you're talking about a time where a lot more people saw something like No Country for Old Men than are seeing something like 12 Years a Slave just a handful of years later. Right. But now that I've gotten everything I, I feel like I want to say about No Country for Old Men out, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't think it's, it can win here. Oh. I think 12 Years a Slave has to move on because it is mm. a film that could have easily gone one of two ways. Yeah. Especially ha having to tackle such a heavy subject. Um, we've seen it tackled in... Uh, uh, the subject of slavery yeah. tackled... Um, 
literally the year prior to it by Quentin Tarantino in Django Unchained, also Oscar nominated for Best Picture, True. that I think having this film come after it just made what was considered like a light spaghetti western uh, mm-hmm. from Django Unchained to a more serious, more grounded that right. this could easily have just flopped at the box office, flopped with critics. But because it had the weight and mantle of such a heavy burden and able to not just overcome that hurdle, but overcome all other obstacles on its way to win the yeah. Academy Award, not let much less be nominated for it, but to win it amongst all the other films against one of Scorsese's best pictures in mm-hmm. The Wolf of Wall Street. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think this is a tough one. Hard. I think we maybe to help us here, we need to like think about like, okay, what are we trying to say with the final winner here? What is the best, best picture and why? Is it necessarily the best made picture or is it just like the one that represents the kind of film that Oscar likes to award this award? too and i think well, if that, that yeah. if, if we were going to go with the kind of war that oscar yeah. likes to win yeah then we would have gone with something like the artist or argo sure. a film yeah. about hollywood and a film about hollywood is a good film it can be an entertaining it, film it can be but it's not necessarily something that i think can end up standing the test of time where something like 12 years yeah. a slave definitely can Withstand so even something like country, no country from old men. I was gonna say, no country from old men strikes me that as well as the one with the longer tail, right? Because I feel like today, if you t- ask a film buff, like, oh, what's what's some of your favorite movies of the last two decades, they're probably more likely to say no country for old men than they are 12 years a slave. Again, not saying anything bad about 12 years a slave by that, it's just it happens to be something that is memorable and something that has has a longer lasting legacy you know for better or for worse and so i think i agree with you for the reasons that you said why you think that 12 years a slave has an advantage here but i think if we're going to be fair with the way we defined the terms here i feel like no country for old men has proved itself to be kind of timeless uh which is quite a feat for a lot of these movies, because you look at this list, how many of these in our original round one here can you say are completely 100% timeless? I think maybe everything everywhere, but everything even that everywhere. has probably maybe some like effects of being when it came out. Uh, but beyond that, I'm looking at this and a lot of these are not movies that are in the conversation in Year of Our Lord 2024. Maybe I mean, even Spotlight, when sp- it came out, it was everywhere. It dominated the conversation. It followed the scandal, and you had it in the round last last round. But yeah, yeah even that is like kind of like in a time capsule moment to itself. I think looking at this list, I think Moonlight, ironically, even though it lost just the last bracket, yes. I still think I think that it's probably one of those timeless movies. But looking at the list here, I don't see anything else. I think it's Moonlight, No Country for Old Men, that they are the only ones that strike me. And maybe Parasite, but it's hard, right? Because so many of these have been have had their moment and then kind of disappeared. Mm-hmm. You can't say that with No Country. You can maybe say that with Twelve Years a Slave, which is unfortunate. So does that mean No Country for Old Men moves on? The oldest film that we have here? It might, it might. I don't know. Do we need a tiebreaker? Do I need to call in my tiebreaker? No, I think looking, I mean, because we're going to do this with Parasite. So, but looking between what it was up against, mm-hmm. I mean, um, for No Country for Old Men, coming off of The Departed, <laughs> Martin Scorsese's <laughs> film from the year prior, mm-hmm. you have No Country for Old Men. Go up against Atonement, Juno, Michael Clayton, and There Will Be Blood. Of those films, it was a two-horse race between There Will Be Blood and No Country for Old Men. Also, think about those nominees for a second. That was a stacked year. That's a stacked year, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you have 12 Years a Slave coming off of the previous year, Argo's winner, which was a right. Hollywood movie about Hollywood. Um, also in that previous year, you had Django Chain and Lincoln. 
and let this. Wow, that's a stacked year for Tor. How did Argo win that year? That's a good question. And Zero Dark Thirty <laughs> and uh, Silver Linings Playbook. My guess is Pop? that I think my guess for that year was that I think a lot oh, of the those movies voting. split the vote. The yeah, ranked voting. So I think yeah. that you end up with. Uh, yeah, I think that's why you end up with Argo. Um, but with Twelve Years a Slave, you have American Hustle, Captain Phillips, Dallas Buyers Club, Gravity, Her, Nebraska, Philomena, and Wolf of Wall Street. Which, going into the night, it was probably going to be Dallas Buyers Club or Wolf of Wall Street. And then Twelve Years mm-hmm. a Slave slowly picked up steam in the weeks leading up to it. Yeah, I don't know. I think that I think you're right that I think Twelve Years a Slave had a lot of work to do to prove itself. Mm-hmm. I think that it was, yeah, in the with the competition that it had and in the constant struggle when it comes to Oscar time about whether something is just Oscar bait or actually worth the award, which I think it definitely dealt with. I remember attending an Oscar party for this that year. I remember the conversation in the room was, it'd be kind of boring if 12 Years a Slave won, but I still had it as my prediction because I was like, yeah, but it probably still will. Probably will. That was the conversation, and that and it did end up winning, which doesn't always happen. Parasite's a perfect example of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it does, it's like you have this mix of like disappointment and excitement because it's like, well, yeah, it should have probably, but what if this other thing had surprised everybody and blown out of the water? And then, then of course, that's not even to talk about the subject matter, as I keep mentioning, which is such a heavy lift. It's so hard to do something like that and not feel not feel too much and not overwhelm an audience and make an audience be like, well, I never want to see that again kind of thing. You don't want to necessarily be like overbearing. And I think it's able to walk that line, which is impressive. I don't want to belittle the fact that that's very impressive. But when you're talking about the idea of the Oscar for Best Picture, something that deserves its name etched into that Oscar for eternity, are we talking about 12 Years a Slave now in the way that we are talking about No Country for Old Men? Or even the way we're talking about Parasite as opposed to Moonlight, which is just the conversation we just had. Right. I think the answer is no, is that yeah. No Country for Old Men, as shown, stands that test of time. I think it does. And I think that, yeah, I think that kind of moves on because of it. <sighs> Yes, but <laughs> last thing I'll say before we yeah. give it to its well, whelming, or give it its flowers and move it on, is that <laughs> with 12 Years of Slave, and as we'll see every year with every nominee, Hollywood likes movies about historical dramas. They do, typically. Historical yeah. accu- historical accuracies. You'll see it, we've seen it here. 12 Years of Slave, Argo, um, Green Book, King's Speech. Well, which one? Is, yeah, Spotlight. which one of these? Yeah, so Spotlight, The King's Speech, Argo, Twelve Years a Slave, Green Book. Uh, the and... artist to an extent. Nah, not really. Uh, yeah, okay. I guess I'll get. I'll say the artist. So six out of the sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. Six out of the sixteen are historical, historically, historical Basically, dramas historical or historical periods. fiction, depending yeah. on the the artist. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty large chunk of it, but it's not all of it. It's not all of it because the other half are original stories, right? And every yeah. now and then, a good story by good storytellers comes from both the pen yeah. and the directors, and not or even in the to case, say directors. I was gonna say, and not even to say like how many of these are adaptations of books, right? When yes. No Country for Old Men is. Uh, I'm looking. The Shape of looking, Water I'm is. Looking. Shape of Water is. The King's Technically, Green Book speech, is. Million Thumb Dog Millionaire mm-hmm. is. Nomad Land yeah. is. So, a handful. But yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. I get what you're saying 100% that 12 Years a Slave seems like the safe pick here. But the fact that you can ask anybody and be like, oh, well, yeah, No Country for Old Men. Yeah, that was a great movie. And like it, it should have won Best Picture. And everybody did. Everybody's happy that it did. Or you'll see the occasional person be like, well, there will be blood still should have won. <laughs> but besides that, yeah. Uh, those, those Daniel um, Daly with stands. <laughs> yeah, all, the, all of them. Uh, yeah, I think No Country for Old Men, I think, wins in this matchup just because of the legacy I think it still holds on to. Okay. 
So I'm fine with that. All right. Then that means oh, the keyboard decided oh, it wasn't going to work. All right. Boom. We have our final. And you could not have told me that this would be our matchup. I, I had a different idea. That. Oh, you could have said I could have told you that. So for our uh, final. If it wasn't going to be Parasite, it was going to be spot. everything everywhere all at once for me. I would say it was Spotlight if the seating hadn't messed that up. But, <laughs> but yes, we have Parasite versus No Country for Old Men, which is almost a, we almost have our brackets for this era, right? You have yes. something from the end of the 2000s, something to the end of the 2010s. Uh, against each other and it goes to show you that by the time you reach an end of a decade that's when you get some real strong some strong art with people being just on the precipice of something new and unexpected uh yeah, yeah. and ultimately i think what as we talked about with both of these films is legacy it's directors who look at other films and people in the industry who look at other films would be like, I'm influenced by that. Mm -hmm. I'm influenced by this. Or like, this film is an inspiration and takes from this other piece of work. Because Hollywood is, if anything, building upon itself. Yeah. Take As... what you know, take what right. you've seen, take what works and build upon it. It's why mm -hmm. after No Country from Old Men 1, you saw a lot of anti-hero films genre yes. yes i think both are seminal releases in the way that they did affect affect uh filmmaking and affect art and culture i think yeah you're right with no country full of men it did set up this kind of pre uh precedent for uh, anti-hero stories that we get in film and also in tv you don't get mad men for example oh sorry mm -hmm. not mad men um uh, breaking, breaking bad. bad is what i was thinking of if yep. you don't get Even something mad like men no country extent, full of men. yeah yeah and yeah i think you're well, yeah, I think that is right. though i think yeah, so it's like around the same time. It's around but, the same time. But yeah, I think that it does um it does set a template. Also, like we mentioned, it is arguably the peak of the Cohen brothers' career. Um, mm -hmm. they would go on to make very different movies after this, uh, for very various reasons. Oh, and now you just, like Burn After Reading? <laughs> I love Burn After Reading, actually. <laughs> It's not a great example if you're trying to call me out. Uh, no, most people don't like Burn After Reading. <laughs> I had fun with it. It's a weird ass like movie. Um, but then yeah, like and so like you have it definitely you can mark that as a piece of time where it's like, oh yeah, from here on, movies look a little different, movies feel a little different. Um, the kind of movie that wins best picture was expanded a little bit. You could say the same thing about Parasite. Like we mentioned, it was in a kind of cultural moment for Korean culture in the US, as well as for uh highlighting Asian American stories. Uh, in this case, not Asian American, but I think it is in that conversation, right? Um, about yeah, but stories... I think Parasite's legacy is that it mm -hmm. kind of highlighted the family stories yeah. that can be told. That everyone has a family story to be told here, because after Parasite, you see that happen with Nomadland, with Coda, yeah. and even with Everything Everywhere All at Once. And I don't think you have Everything Everywhere All at Once is win if Parasite doesn't win in 2019. I think that's mm -hmm. very important. It kind of kicks the door open. For a movie like Everything Everywhere All at Once to have a chance to win as much as it does. Yeah. I think that's absolutely a through line there. Um, just a couple of years, but still. Um yeah, but still like part of that, not just Korean or like Asian culture, mm -hmm. but the family stories being told through it. Yeah. And yeah, I think uh, whereas at surface level it seems like they're doing very different things, these two movies, I think at the same time. Yeah, I think the legacy tells a similar story, which is these are movies that are still being going to be talked about in ten more years. Mm -hmm. I think Parasite people are going to be looking back, at, looking back at that in ten years and being like, "Oh yeah, like still like very such a well crafted, interesting story with the that visual representation you were talking about, and a story about a very specific um, a culture uh, which is important." Um, yeah. It's it's a tough matchup because it does feel a little apples to oranges here a little bit for me. They both uh, win. <laughs> yeah, I wish I almost wish that we could do that. Um, because I don't know. Is one A, the, one B. Yeah. Is here here's the pitch then. Is the surprise of Parasite's win in a year where it was not at all discussed as being the favorite going into the night, in a year which 
And if you want to pull up what it was up against. Oh, uh, I have it up. If you want to go yeah, you have that up. What yeah. was it actually up against? I vaguely remember. It was up against your dad's favorite movie, Ford vs. Ferrari. <laughs> uh, Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jojo Rabbit. Joker. Little Women. Marriage Story. Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And what was probably the favorite going into the night, uh, Sam Mendes one take shot film, 1917. That's right. So yeah, in that, if you even look at that, it's a wonder the Parasite won because think mm-hmm. about what you have in the players you have. You have a historical war film that is done in an interesting cinematography. You cinematography. have a historical war film. Like, you have a yeah. Nazi movie about film. Hollywood. Movie about Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, Martin Scorsese film. Yeah. Uh, and a all women cast in Little Women, an adaptation, adaptation of a classic, yeah, yeah. adaptation of a classic a piece of literature. Yeah. You had all of that working against it, a movie that should not probably on paper have won Best Picture, and yet it did. So, is that narrative, is that part of the legacy of Parasite stronger than one we're talking about with No Country for Old Men on Oscar night, where it had a neck and neck race with There Will Be Blood? That it was more people were seeing movies than ever. It was a huge night. Like it had a cultural impact. Like it was. It's a different like a different era, of course. But like, is that momentum and is that legacy, and it had the Coen Brothers backing it. Like, is that all a stronger argument than the one for Par- *Parasite*, which came out of nowhere to surprise everybody? I don't know. I was just looking at uh, the director for There Will Be Blood, um, Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah, mm-hmm. PTA. Guy PTA? who doesn't always win his Oscars either. He's, he's Yes. Like, it's also a tricky one. Yeah, but even the country went up against a uh, World War II film in Atonement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, comedy, which was a rare in Juno. Yeah. And um, George Clooney's thriller michael clayton which is one of those movies just like no country for old men where movie buffs will like talk endlessly at you about michael clayton yes <laughs> so yeah i don't i don't know i think my heart and my mind are in two different places here i think my heart is saying the thing that parasite was able to pull off is so impressive that i think that it earns that modern classic um like title and i think has a advantage in this race because of it is it a part of the turner classic movie (laughs) it might be now yeah then my mind however says the timelessness and the legacy of no country for old men is too big to fail whereas like my mind is saying the fact that this is the oldest movie on this list and it's here says a lot about the kind of movie it is it's a movie's movie It is like the movie that other people think of when they think about movies, you know, to a certain extent. It's like, oh, yeah, this is the best picture winner of the last. As as I mentioned, it's a movie that for the past 16 years Mm -hmm. has influenced (laughs) a lot of other movies, not just best picture winners, just the movie and just pop culture in general. But yeah, so it's it's almost like kind of like the the parasite still has legs, though. Yeah, that's the thing. I think it's almost like a new, uh, modern version of that same yeah. idea where, like I said, in 10 years, we're going to be having this conversation about parasites. I'll go, oh, yeah, remember how like important it was that parasite won? That kind of thing. And so like, that's where I'm divided here is whether this should be the pick that I feel like emotionally makes the most sense, which is, oh, it's so important to Parasite 1. It is the movie for the future. It is set up a template for going forward. And it makes me hopeful for what we're going to see from Best Picture winners. Or is it the logic part of me that wants to say, well, like, no, but No Country for Old Men should be the winner here. Because if you look at all 16 of these films, No Country for Old Men is the moviest movie of all of them. Like, and I don't know. It's, it's how you want to define best picture. And what the Oscars right. have to do every year is how you define yeah. the best picture out of all of these different genres and storytelling and techniques. Is... All right, let's do it that way then. Do you want to say, I have not seen Parasite, so I can't do that. Or No Country you, for Old Men. You so haven't I can't seen either that. of these films. No. Wow. So, you, so then you need to say, like, <laughs> as a movie, 
I'll use your line, your favorite line, which is, which of these two is something you want to return to over and over again more than the other? And I will say that as much as I like using that line, I yeah. gave my answer earlier uh -huh. in that as soon as HBO Max came out, yep. and as soon as Parasite was available, I watched it. I'll and tell I you, have yeah. Not gone back to watch No Country for Old Men. It's it's an important film. Yeah. It's a film that has a lot of many iconic scenes, iconic memory, a lot of the those the the storytelling structures and characters are like burned into my memory because it's yeah. that good and that iconic. But as I mentioned, it's also not something that I'm actively seeking, like, oh, the country for old men's on. Let me right. go put that on. Right, right. And that just may be with time. It's like, oh, I've now considered that an old, an older movie. Which <laughs> Parasite is more of a modern classic. I, I think that's fair. And I think that ultimately this is the Media Boat Podcast's best picture face off. So we can also put that into this, where it's not necessarily what we think objectively is the best picture to rule all best pictures. I think that we can determine what that means. And it sounds like where we've led ourselves to is, is to paradise... combine them and call it yeah. no parasite for old men. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. No, I think that what we've led to is, I think I'm comfortable saying that as something that shows us hope for the future and is a, a um, I guess a more watchable i guess is the word i would use a more watchable version of the modern masterpiece i think the edge goes to parasite for us specifically for the two of us doing this bracket i think if you have maybe somebody perhaps a little older i think you have somebody from that's more of a movie like a movie like nerd background than the two of us i think maybe this goes no country for old men's way but I think we gave it its time. I think we gave it its legacy. I think we, it's here for a reason in the finals. But for the Media Boat podcast, the tone of this conversation seems to be in Parasite's favor. As we get to the end, I want to talk about the, the ending of both of these movies. Yeah. Here. No Country for Old Men ends on kind of like a downer note, on kind of mm -hmm. a um, an unknown note, an uncertain note, because your spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen this movie god go watch it um <laughs> anton sugar your antagonist in this film doesn't get caught has no comeuppance right Tommy Lee jones is sheriff's character just is just tired at the end and just doesn't want to continue and yeah. just no sometimes it just turns out this way whereas with parasite when he gets to the end you do feel like there's a very chaotic ending <laughs> Um, with just all, all these different threads all coming to a head. And it does kind of end with this hope, with this kind of feeling that everything does eventually resolve itself, that it may not be immediate. You may not see it for a, a, for years, but if you keep at it, there is hope to an ending mm -hmm. uh, that Parasite has. And I think that's why it, wins because it's yeah the ending feeling you get from parasite is a better feeling than from no country for old men because we had this discussion when the country for old men came <laughs> out is that wait it just ends yeah what do you mean it just ends like he's still out there there's still stuff to happen what do you mean it just ends whereas with parasite it's a feels more like a complete film whereas yes that's what the common brothers were going for they wanted that yeah, right. ambiguous ending that was part of like the zeitgeist at the time is that you can do that it doesn't have mm. to end. And then we've seen that play out over the past couple of years, past 15 years. But with Parasite okay. and with the, as we mentioned, the four following films from it that won't end up to win Best Picture, you can have a nicely rounded, tight story where story and cinematography all and directorial all meld together to create this masterpiece of a film mm -hmm. that can be studied that will be studied that will be dissected and influence like you said its legacy going forward yeah i absolutely agree with you i think that that's i think that that really kind of puts a puts a period at the end of the sentence like i think movies have changed a lot and i think parasite is um 
symbolic of that in a lot of ways of what a modern movie can and should do, what modern storytelling can do, how we can put lights on uh, minority cultures that we couldn't necessarily put as reliably before, how we can tell different stories, different kinds of stories in new and innovative ways. And whereas you can still make movies like No Country for Old Men, that's not going to go away. I think the fact that we've opened the door to other kinds of stories and other kinds of storytelling techniques is nothing but good news. And I think it's a perfect example of the modern Best Picture winner that I think we did see with Everything Everywhere All at Once and to a much, much lesser extent with Oppenheimer this year. I think Oppenheimer is a little yes. bit more traditional, but... Yes, but even what Oppenheimer was up against were mm -hmm. intimate storytellings in right. American fiction, Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, uh, Poor Things, Zone of Interest, even so yes. much to uh, Killers of a Flower, Flower Moon and Past Lives. I think that, you don't get something as weird as poor things unless you have these weirder movies kind of breaking into the best picture mm -hmm. uh, nominees here. So, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So, yeah, I say I think we are pretty agreed that Parasite can be our winner. Voila, we have a winner, we folks. We did it. It's I'm ending the tournament. I don't know what this does. I guess we'll find out. It just hey, says, uh, who wins. look at that. <laughs> no country for old men. Three to one. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. It, it fought a good fight, but it didn't quite make it. And then, uh, yeah, your winner is Parasite. So, uh, yeah, I'll stop my share here and we can go back to just our little mugs yep. and wrap this one up. So thank you for joining us for the Media Boat Podcast 2024 March Madness Bracket, where we told you that the best, best picture of the last uh 16 years was parasite and we're right you're wrong <laughs> and if you'd like to argue with us you can tell us how we were wrong and give us your uh thoughts and why no country for all ventured one by emailing us at mediabotpodcast at gmail.com all right so do that and we'll see you guys next time for a regular episode of the media boat podcast if you want to tune in to find out where that is youtube.com search media boat podcast podcast service of your choice search media boat podcast you'll find us if you do either of those things so Tune in. Join us for our regular shows every week. And in the meantime, and we're if gone. you want to see how Matt got to these final four picks, you can <laughs> yeah. watch all of those videos yeah. right now. Yeah. I'm going to point to one of the icons to my left or right. <laughs> it's got to be one of those. All, all right. right. See ya. Bye.